name is Dorgan Keeney, and I'm one of the librarians here at um, Johnson Public Library. And I want to welcome you to this presentation on Amazing Vermont Insects by Ron Kelly. And um, you can ask questions by raising your hand or uh, putting them in the chat room. I'll be watching the chat room. And um, otherwise, keep your computers muted, if you would. And with that, I'm going to Oh, and just to let you know that this will be recorded and um, and and archived with Green Mountain Access Television, and so there'll be a link that where people can see it who have missed it today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to to Ron Kelly. Since there's, we're few in numbers, so I'll probably not to be long-winded. <laughs> um, just to give you some background, I spent 35 years as a forest health specialist with the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And in that job, I had to deal with almost everything that affected tree health, including forest insects. And because I've always loved photography, I was able to combine that passion with my work. And I took pictures of everything I saw, including insects, of course. So some of what I'm going to show are these old pictures that were uh, scans from my color transparency slides. And then after I retired 12 years ago, I, I started taking more pictures of pictures of insects just for their beauty and diversity. So I've added some of those in here as well. I took this picture out of the Smithsonian Act, uh, Magazine many, many years ago to show the, the diversity of Butterfly wings. So somebody went through all the butterfly, the butterflies in their collection, and they found every letter of the alphabet on a butterfly wing. And I've always felt as though somebody stole the M. And this shows the number of described species by major groups. And you can see the insects by far the largest. Uh, there's the, the fungi, there's the uh, spiders and arachnids, and there's the terrestrial. It's good to keep in mind that insect population growth uh, is affected by their their potential to reproduce, how many in, how many eggs the female lays, and one thing and another. But there's always these environmental resistance factors that are trying to keep the insect populations low. So you have your parasites, your predators. Predators include the beetles, the other insects, the mice, the birds, and then you have the weather influences. And so natural, naturally, in a, uh, with a natural population, the uh, native population, it takes a few years for the insects to become an outbreak, and the natural controls lag behind because they need an abundance of the host population to bring up their own population levels. So for that reason, the populations tend to be high for a few years in a row before the, the, the uh parasites and what have you, bring this right back down to very low levels. Another very important thing is food availability. So if all the favorite food of the insect is in one space, one place, um, it's a lot easier for the insect to become uh, very abundant. So anytime you go to a monoculture, you're gonna get more insect problems. The more diversity, the better. And I've kind of broken this into different groups. So I'm gonna go through insects by their groups. And there's a number of different groups that are, are sucking insects. So I kind of all lump them together. There are these large aphids that sometimes appear on fir trees. There's this aphid that likes to attack balsam fir. And if you get a uh, local balsam fir Christmas trees, you may have noticed some of this needle curling in the past. Uh, if it's light, it's not too bad, uh, not too noticeable, and you may not have paid any attention to it. But if it's heavy like this, it does affect marketability. There is some insects that are adelgids, and adelgids are similar to aphids, but most of them have a, an alternate uh, host. And there's some that just cover their bodies with wax, like this one on pine, heavy. Uh, there are ones that cause galls on spruce, a, a bunch of different species. 
And if you open up the gall, you'll see the little aphids in the little cavities in underneath there. I should say adelgids. And a mature adelgid uh, gall looks like this. And this is when the adults, the winged adults emerge. The hemlock woolly adelgid, of course, is an uh, exotic invasive that came from Asia. But again, it has that white wax over it. Uh, when they first hatch, you just see these little black dots on the stems. But their feeding causes dieback and sometimes tree mortality. And it came into Vermont in the early 2000s. And this is an old slide where they were located in 2008. Um, they spread a little bit further north since then, and they've also spread over into Bennington. But the state has been releasing predators such as this one to help control them. Uh, only long time, long term will we know how successful that is. They are affected by cold winter temperatures and are killed when winter, te when winter temperatures exceed minus 22. That certainly didn't happen this year. More sensitive uh, in March than they are January, February. They're likely to evolve to withstand colder winter temperatures over time. And with global warming, that's gonna have a positive effect on their northward movement. There are also scale insects that are sucking insects that have this little protective cover over the top, the top of their body. There's lots of those. I'm just gonna show you one, Lacanium scale. Uh, this was heavy on Butternut Mountain area of Johnson a number of years ago. Uh, when the scales feed, they produce this honeydew that drips down and it lands on the foliage down below, like you see here. And you may get sooty mold growing on it, but that's just a secondary fungus, nothing to be concerned about. Then there are midgets and mites, which are in the fly group. There's this irinium gall mite that's kind of fairly common on sugar maple. Uh, looks terrible, but isn't too bad, doesn't really affect the tree that much. Then there's a bladder gall mite and a spindle gall mite. So I'm trying to throw in things, throw, uh, show you things that you are likely to see on your own trees. Now I'm gonna go into a life cycle of one particular insect that's a favorite of mine. Um, I still do some consulting for Christmas tree pest management. And this is one insect that I, I worked with a lot in the past. So it's a little midge that lays its eggs in balsam fir just after the, the bud sheaths come off. But this is really a tale of two midges because there's a, a second midge that looks like the first that's actually a control for the first one. And when this was first identified, the scientists identified the wrong midge as the gall maker. So they lay their eggs in the needles as a egg cluster here. Some legs, yeah, eggs newly laid. The hatching larvae caused the, the needle tissue to expand around it and it appears to sink into the gall. The good midge is attracted to the gall maker larvae and becomes enveloped with them in the gall. So as the good midge builds up, then it becomes more abundant. And this is what the galls look like. Needless to say, those brown up and fall off the tree. So when a tree is heavily infested like this, you're not gonna be able to sell it. But here are the two midgets. Up on the top is the, the gall maker. And the lower right is the good midge. Think you could tell them apart? Well, you can because if you look at them under a microscope, the gall maker has a vein that curves at the end and it has gaps between double beads of antennae. While the, the good midge has a straight vein and no gaps between the antennal beads. And here's a picture of the two midges inside the gall. So you've got the, the gall maker, lower right, and the, the one that controls it being a little more orange in color. 
and later in the year, you can see the orange one, the good one is getting bigger, the gall maker is getting smaller and does not develop. Even later, you see the same effect. So most of the gall makers exit the end of September while the good midge exits in October. And then they overwinter in the soil. Now we'll move on to beetles. Japanese beetle, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. <laughs> I have a plum tree that they love. They also seem to love uh, my pole bean leaves. I don't know if you're growing day lilies, but this is the lily leaf beetle, which is an introduced pest that just showed up maybe 15 years ago and really riddles the, the leaves on those plants. White pine weevil is one of our native beetles that causes the the terminals to die. Here's one here. They lay their eggs just underneath the buds for this year's growth and then the larvae tunnel downward and girdle that stem. And if you look, shave off some of the bark, you can see them in there. And they attack spruces as well as pines. If you catch it early enough in the year, you can prune out the infested leader and at least kill them so they won't develop for next year. If you don't do that, you can get what we call a cabbage pine, many, many leaders instead of one good one. One of our native beetles that's really beautiful is the sugar maple borer. And I think I've only seen two or three adults in my lifetime. They cause this kind of a defect that you see on the sides of the sugar maple. And that little tunnel there is where the larvae tunneled across the grain of the wood. So they lay their eggs in the tree. There's the larva. There's a fairly fresh attack here. And that's what the larval uh, burrow looks like when they go deep in the tree to pupate. And there's a very old scar there, but that's still sugar maple borer. So they're gonna be more successful on the slow going stress trees. And here's a tree that was attacked in 86, uh, it was thinned in 79, but not soon enough to prevent the attack. And then later on, the growth rings got much, much better. So that it should be much uh, less susceptible in the future. The Asian longhorn beetle, of course, is one that the sugar makers are concerned about. Another one from uh, China. Ron, could you go back to that former slide? And I don't understand why um, the growth rings, um, they're, they're bigger after 86. And you said they're, it would be less apt to be attacked. Why would that be? Yeah, well, after the trees were thin, it took a while for the tree to respond to that thinning. So it was still vulnerable to attack in 86. But if you look out at 94, it, it's doing much, much better. So why did the thinning help? Um, why would that prevent a future attack? Gives the tree more room to grow. So trees are always competing with one another. That's why we thin them. No, That's I understand that. But I was trying to understand why, uh, if it had anything to do with the, the success of the tree growing, does it have anything to do with whether it's going to be susceptible to this um, pest? That makes sense. I'm, not, I'm sorry, Dory. I'm not following your question. <laughs> um, I thought there was some you were uh, um, making a relationship between the, the robust growth of the tree and its vulnerability to this particular um, borer. Right. Yeah. If the tree is slow growing and stressed, so that adult is going to be more successful in laying its eggs inside and getting those larvae to develop. That's what I didn't understand. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So back to Asian longhorn beetle. These are pictures I took down in uh, Worcester, Mass, because there's an infestation there. It's still under quarantine, and the way they combat this is they they end up cutting all of the the, the infested trees as well as nearby susceptible trees, 
And uh, this insect has been eradicated from numerous places where it came in originally into Chicago and it was eradicated there, it came into New York and it eradicate, was eradicated from one or two places there, but it still spreads over time and is still, still present in a few places. But it's a big beetle, it's slow moving, it doesn't spread quickly. And it's much bigger than our native uh, beetles in this group. Here's a native Sawyer here. And that's what that one looks like, which, which uh, attacks recently dead or recently killed wood, not live trees. Branch dieback due to Asian longhorn beetle. Was introduced from infested woodpacking material on, sh on ships. Adults emerge in May to August, lay eggs in pits chewed through the bark. Then the young larvae feed in the cambium initially, then tunnel deep into the sapwood. And when they emerge, they make these large holes. Uh, you can insert a pencil in there. So, <laughs> so like a tap hole. And so it, you know, it can lead to tree death, but uh, it has, as I said, it has been successfully eradicated from several locations. The emerald ash borer, on the other hand, that's another China pest, and that threatens all ash trees in North America. In fact, it's pretty well distributed through all ash trees in North America now. And when it was first discovered in Michigan in 2002, the documented information on it only could fit, could fit on just one page of paper because all of the uh, technical records were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So I spent a week in Michigan in 2006 when it was still pretty much confined to Michigan, trying to learn what I could about this insect. And so these pictures are all some I took out there. The adults can fly one and a half to two miles. So that's better than the Asian longhorn beetle. They're present from June to August, and they feed on ash foliage. This picture of mine is one that they show a lot on WCAX local television when they talk about this insect. And in Michigan, when I was out there, it was spreading at four miles per year, it had spread four miles per year in the first one to five years. One to six to 10 years, they expected it to spread 18 miles a year. And initially, Stopping it spread through firewood was the main goal because of course it can spread long distances by firewood. And so I'm sure we slowed the spread by, by not allowing uh, outside, out state, out of state firewood into the states, but uh, now the insect is here. And it does a number on ash. This is a picture of a street in the Detroit suburb, and that's all ash. Before the ash was planted, it was all elms, and they all got killed by Dutch elm disease, so we don't seem to learn. So that's the street after all the ash was removed. And at that point, they'd spent 12 million already on removals. And this is where it is in Vermont, uh, closest Infestation to us, I believe, is in uh, Belvedere or someplace like that, some up in the northwest corner. And the first place it was discovered is bright red area right here. <laughs> so the most important diagnostic symptoms of this disease are the D-shaped exit holes. And if you peel the back bark back, all of the larval tunnels underneath there that are causing the tree to be girdled. And then the woodpeckers will go after those larvae. So if you see a lot of woodpecker activity, that could be a tree that was infested. The only hope for this insect is introducing a native parasites that came from China. There are several of them that are being released. Some are, are egg parasites, some are larval parasites. And they seem to be having some effect, but we won't know uh, for a lot, many years how effective they are. So I think 
The strategy right now is to remove the large trees that would be heavily infested and produce huge populations of the, the uh, ash borer. And then hopefully these things will begin to control it when the population levels are lower on the remaining trees. I have a question yeah. regarding these, these um, pests that are being introduced from out of the country or out of, it sounds like over in Asia. The, the and from their native range, yeah. Yeah, so is there concern that they might cause other problems, you know, as they get rid of? Nowadays, they go through a rigorous testing process to make sure they don't affect any non-target insects. You okay. know, many, many years ago, this was a big problem sometimes for things that were brought in. Yeah. But, but this, they, they have to go through rigorous testing nowadays before they're That's released. Concern. Good. And just to show you some other in, other green insects. <laughs> so there's the emerald ash borer. Uh, most of these are gonna be bigger. Uh, the one that most people confuse with it are the tiger beetles, like the six-spotted tiger beetle. And those are very common. Here's one here. And here's another picture of the, of the insect that I took. Uh, showing all the hairs on it, because it is a predator. So it, it's a good guy. <laughs> and uh, in the beetle group, um, here's one that even feeds on pollen that's in that longhorn beetle group, the same group as the Asian longhorn beetle. And there are insects that are opportunists. Best example of that are the bark beetles. So they'll build up on recently dead and recently killed trees. And when they get their population built up to significant levels, then they can sometimes attack uh, live trees, especially stress trees like drought stress trees. A great example of that is the mountain pine beetle in Colorado. Uh, this is a picture I took a few years, quite a few years ago near Vail of a lodgepole pine killed by the mountain pine beetle. So you get these trees get mature, they get stressed because they're crowded then you get drought conditions, then the beetle builds up, it moves on, in on the stress trees, uh, they produce something called an aggregation pheromone that calls all the, their, their beetle friends in, and then they kill that tree and kill the other, other trees around there. But a lot of, there are beetles that are good too, and of course the ladybird beetles are a good example of that. That one attacks those aphids I showed you earlier that occur on balsam fir. But then there's the Halloween ladybird beetle that you may see in your house. Uh, these were introduced into the, the country, I think in the 1920s down south somewhere to control uh, aphids on cotton. And they've moved north since then. And they just showed up in Vermont maybe, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, but they, they like to, uh, invade the house for a place to spend the winter because they like to hibernate uh, in a warm place. And they're not really too concerning except they're a nuisance. Another house pest you might see is this uh, conifer seed, be seed bug. Uh, they infest pine cones. So when you've had a really heavy cone year for pine, you tend to get these things uh, coming into the house the following fall. Now I'm gonna move on to the Lepidopter group, moths and butterflies. The gypsy moth is one of our oldest introduced pests because it was brought into Boston area from Europe at way back in 1869. That's the different life stages. We've had periodic outbreaks in Vermont over the past, and we haven't hadn't had one since about 1990 to, until this past past year, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So this this is a picture of lots of female moths laying eggs. Favorite host is oak. Eggs hatching, feeding on oak, mature larva material larvae, male mating with a female. Females can't fly. So they have to wait for the males to find them. 
Because of that, they have a very powerful pheromone to attract the males. And apparently there are human, human pheromones as well. But uh, in this case, we're talking about insects. <laughs> and we have pheromone traps that we use for trapping various forest insects, which are baited with the pheromone. Um, this is an example of a trap here. We tried them many years ago for gypsy moth, but the pheromone was so powerful that a trap would get filled up even if there wasn't going to be an outbreak. And I handled that pheromone back then, that must have been 30 years ago, and I'm still attractive to the male moths. And when we went to, to Maine a few years ago, all the, where there were more gypsy moths, all of a sudden there were male moths filling up my car. And everybody in my household is also attracted to them. That tells you how powerful the pheromone is. And like I said, there's apparently some people are trying to uh, cash in on this uh, with human pheromones. Now, it's important to note that healthy hardwoods can often survive one or more years of complete defoliation where conifers usually die after one complete defoliation because they store a lot of their energy, reser energy reserves in the old needles, whereas hardwoods store most of their energy in the roots. Here's some gypsy moth defoliation. Here's an example of refoliation. These new little leaves, uh, yellower than the original ones, come out a few weeks after the tree is heavily defoliated. The lat allows the tree to get it through the rest of the year. And the, but there again, parasites that attack the gypsy moth. There's a pupa of a fly parasite. There are those that attack the eggs. There are beetles that attack the larvae. That was a healthy gypsy moth larvae at larva of about three minutes before I took the picture. Mice feed on the pupae. Birds feed on the insect. Uh, mainly the cuckoo, because there aren't too many birds that like the hairs on this insect. There's viruses that kill insects, including gypsy moth. But the most important control is this one, a fungus called Entomophaga mamega. This was introduced into Boston area in 1910, hoping that it would be a biological control for gypsy moth but it didn't show up in Vermont until 1989. And since then, it's been controlling the gypsy moth up until this past year. And it's been doing the same throughout the Northeast. So can anybody guess why this year it was a problem? It was a dry summer, dry spring. Right, it was droughty. Mm -hmm. So the fungus didn't do its thing like it normally does. So, and there are big, there are lots of egg masses out there for next year. So it remains to be seen whether it's going to be a big problem next year or not. It really depends on the weather. Forest tent caterpillar is a native insect that also goes in cycles. It loves sugar maple. Notice it has those white keyhole markings on it. And we have periodic outbreaks. In fact, there's one more recent one than this slide shows, not, not too long ago. And there are a number of sugar, bush, sugar makers that, that spray for it because it does affect uh, the amount of sugar that you get in the sap. There's the moth, male moth, lays its <laughs> eggs like around the twig like this. Did we have a recent breakout of these? Of these? Yeah, it was just a few years ago. Yeah, Two, no, not one, not the same time as the gypsy moths. We're talking about forest head caterpillar now. Right, and they had a we different had, outbreak. A we different had that, an outbreak in Lamoille County a few years ago, but we don't tend to get gypsy moth over here because we don't have enough oak. Oh, I'm over in northern Warren County and we were infiltrated. Oh Warren. yeah, they used to have uh, spray projects there years ago. And of course, Pennsylvania had multiple spray projects for gypsy moth. Oh. Yep. So this showing the uh, forest tent caterpillar, a new egg mass versus one with an old one where the, egg, the uh, larvae have emerged. 
and there's the larvae emerging and feeding. And they, they con congregate in masses on the side of the tree like this and spend just spend a little bit of light webbing over the mass, but they don't make tents. They spin up a pupil case in the leaves. Here's some uh, forest tent defoliation, uh, some virus killed ones. One of those callosoma beetles attacking a larva, a stink bug. And this is a picture I took of some stink bug eggs in a newly hatched nymph. Parasitic fly, pupil case. But the number one control agent for forest tent is the friendly fly. So-called because they like to land all over you. And this one is on my big toe. So once the friendly fly gets built up, then they, they're everywhere and they end up bringing the populations back down. I'm curious about a particular fly that stings. They look like normal house flies, or as you call them, friendly flies, but they bite. They're like little stingers. And I haven't seen them in Lamoille County. Again, I've seen them in Northern Warren County. But there are lots of biting flies. You know, you're familiar with deer flies and horse flies, and yeah, these are small. There are smaller have... ones that the smaller ones that bite as well. Yeah. Well, they feel like they were introduced. I feel like they were introduced because they weren't around 40 years ago, and now they are infested. Don't, don't know. <laughs> anyway, we we uh, we do successfully trap forest tent caterpillar, and this shows the the pheromone trap trap data just prior to the 2005 2006 outbreak. And nowadays, the material of choice for, for dealing with a forest uh, insect problem is this bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a naturally occurring bacterium, and it affects just the larvae of, of the insects that feed on it and nothing else. And in the old days, when I first got into forest pest control, we used helium-filled balloons to mark the spray corners. And now today, but uh, since then, things have gotten much higher tech and everything is done by GPS and it even shows you the, uh, the spray patterns. Uh, this is a color infrared slide of the last gypsy moth project in 1990 that I was involved with. And it shows the, the brighter red means better, healthier trees. The gray means defoliated trees. So you can see it's a much more defoliated outside the spray blocks. And this was over in the Colchester area. And I remember I mentioned diversity being important. Uh, there was a study at UVM a few years ago showing that leaving 25% non-sugar maple significantly decreased the damage by maple defoliators, such as forest tent. When, when I say tent people, tent caterpillar, a lot of people think about Eastern tent caterpillar, but it's a pest of fruit trees and cherry and it does make a tent. And it has a white stripe down its back and not white keyhole markings. There's some on the outside of the tent. Uh, another forest insect, I'm not just to mention it's a fairly pretty larva called a saddle prawn, it likes maple. Uh, but this one has an egg parasite that is the primary control factor and those eggs turn black. Maple leaf cutter is one that you may see uh, evidence of on your maples. Another sugar maple pest. The adults are little moths. They lay the eggs in the leaf and the, the insect begins by mining the leaf. And then it cuts out of the mine, starts making holes in the leaf to make a case around its body. There's a larva with its head out for feeding. Some uh, damage, damage by the end of the year. So it's a, a gradual defoliation over the course of the summer. 
So it's not as serious as a pest that takes all the leaves off earlier in the year. Some aerial view of defoliation. You see a few green trees in there that were not maples. Overwinters in the leaf litter, so it's probably affected by fungi in the leaves. Another insect that feeds in the, in the leaf uh, and gradually defoliates the tree is the trumpet skeletonizer. And I only show you this because it, it makes a tube out of its excrement and the larva lives inside that. So it's kind of unusual. When you see the webs toward the end of the year, this is not tent caterpillar, but fall webworm. And they attack all kinds of different trees, but are not too serious on any one tree. Can get a lot of webs sometimes. Now I gotta show you a few good moths. I think we have only uh, three species of giant silk moths in Vermont. And one of them is the Luna moth. Another is the Cecropia moth. This is the larva of the Cecropia. There's the polyphemus moth. I really love the uh, eye spots on the rear wings on this one. And there's a, 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 another one, but I don't have a picture of it. <laughs> uh, here's a moth that also feeds on pollen and is a daytime flyer, while most moths are nighttime flyers. And here's a picture of a, a clear ring called the hummingbird moth. And I have to tell you, I've been trying to take a picture of one of these for years. <laughs> and they're not easy to take a picture of because they're so darn fast. But I have a, a bunch of bee bomb and I was sitting out in the chair getting pictures of hummingbirds. And so my camera was set up for a fast speed, shutter speed last summer. And one of these flew in and I was able to get a decent picture of it. But this is in the, in the sphinx moth group of moths. And you can see it's long proboscis here. Now the larvae of sphinx moths often have a horn. So you may think of tomato hornworm. This is a bed straw uh, horn worm, but it has a similar type of uh, horn on the end. So they are, can be very large larvae. <laughs> I just saw a morning cloak yes, day before yesterday. So this is one of the first butterflies to come out in the spring. Uh, so now we're into butterflies. Um, it overwinters as an adult and that's why it emerges early. And because its wings are, are dark, it can absorb the sun better on those cold days. But its larvae are actually a, a pest, spiny elm caterpillar. Here's a tiger swallowtail, one of my favorite uh, butterflies, very common. Here's a black swallowtail, a little, quite a bit smaller than the tiger. But this is what the larva looks like, and it has this proboscis that it sticks out to ward off its enemies. So when I disturbed it, it did that for me. Here's a Milbert's tortoise shell, which is another one that often overwinters as an adult and comes out early. Uh, here's an Atlantis fritillary. Silverboard of fertility. So now I'm into my beautiful picture taking. <laughs> Here's an admiral butterfly. These are very common and then often congregate on the, on the road surface. This is a red admiral, which is much less common than that black one. Painted butterfly, one of my favorite butterflies. Monarchs, I'm sure you're all familiar with monarchs. Uh, this is a male monarch. This is a female. Notice that the 
the wing veins are much, much thicker on the female. And although populations were, were we were, people were concerned about them a few years ago, uh, they have rebounded some. The ones we see are actually third generation. So they have to do well in the Southwest before they uh, can produce, produce another generation that comes eventually up to here. Now let's talk about the Hymenoptera group, the bees and wasps. There's a group called sawflies because they have a saw-like ovipositor that they use to lay eggs in their host material. And the larvae are different from Lepidoptera larvae and if they have bumps all along the, the abdomen called prolegs, here's a good example of that. One you might see on the uh, shade trees is mountain ash sawfly. Some early mountain ash sawfly feeding. If you have oaks, you might see oak slug sawfly. Then there's birch leaf miner, which is also a sawfly as an adult. Those insects mine the leaves though. And here's some inside a leaf and they can really brown up the tree. This is a pigeon tremex wood wasp. Uh, it's not a pest, but it attacks recently killed hardwoods like sugar maple or dead trees, dead areas on trees. But what's interesting is there, this ichneumon wasp that goes after the larvae of the pigeon tremex. And it has this extremely long ovipositor. <laughs> it goes all the way around. It joins those pieces together to make a, a really effective penetrator into the wood to get after the wasp larvae. Here's another parasite. And of course, there are the bees. The bumblebees are very important. And there's a, a group in the Vermont Center for Eco Studies that's been studying uh, bumblebees and trying to identify the species that we have because we have lost a number of species. Honeybee, of course, is very important for pollination. This is an open honeybee nest that I took a picture of many years ago in a large balsam fir. Very unusual. <laughs> Never seen anything like it since. You might think this is a bee, but it's a fly. And you can tell that because it has only one pair of membranous wings. And you can see the head is shaped more like a fly. Here's a pair of, of insects in that same group called surfids. And they, they produce larvae that feed uh, as predators on other insects like aphids. But you can tell it's a fly because again, it has just one pair of wings and where the back wing should be, they have these little protrusions, right? Like you see a yellow one here and a little one there. That's all they have for rear wings called haltiers. Now we're just on to uh, one of my favorite groups and that's the dragonflies and damselflies or odes for short. And since I'm out on Green River Reservoir a lot, uh, monitoring the loons and taking my camera with me, I've made it my, my uh, task to, I try to identify as many of these insects that I can that occur on Green River Reservoir. So I'm gonna show you pictures of a few of these. This is a Canada Darner. They lay their eggs in stems like this lily here. So here's a darner laying its eggs into the lily. That's its reflection. The eggs hatch into larvae, which are aquatic and feed on insects and small aquatic organisms. When they emerge and pupate, they often leave this cast skin where they emerge. This is a, one of the bluet damselflies, very common. 
This is an aurora damselfly. Here's a pair of these mating. The males tend to be more colorful than the females. You can see the female is a little duller. Uh, when the male wants to mate, it grabs the female behind the head. And then if the female accepts it, it curls its abdomen up to the male and allows the male to uh, give it its sperm. This is an Eastern Forktail, a very common damsel. Has a number of different color variations, and this is an immature one that's orange. The mature ones are blue, bluish. And there are some damselflies that are spread wings. Instead of holding the wings over the back of the abdomen, they spread them out a little bit like this. Here's a variable damsel. Very pretty. Now onto the dragonflies, this black shoulder spiny leg is quite common and likes to dive bomb your head when you're swimming or land on the front of your canoe or kayak. Here's a beaver pond basket tail. Common white tail male. Common white tail female. Slady skimmer, those are very common. Calico pennant, uh, I just saw one last year and this was it. That's the female calico pennant. Trout spotted skimmer. And uh, Canada darner again, but this is a different picture. And there's the female. You see the females a little bit different color, a little duller in color. Autumn meadow hawk, which meadow hawk, which is one of the uh, the later flying small dragonflies that occurs in late fall, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, welcome. More questions. You mentioned something about the uh, friendly butterflies eating silk. Did I hear you say something about silk? I meant to ask you that question early on, and I kind of forgotten the reference. Um, it, you've lost me there because you're talking about two different things that I talked about. So I'm trying to figure out which one is the question. There was a friendly fly that was a parasite. And, and it was more recent, it was with the, the beginning of your uh, butterflies. The beginning of the butterflies. Yes. And there was like five different butterflies that I thought had something to do with silk. Silk. Well, I said that was moths, silk moths. Oh, moths. Okay. So the Luna, the Cecropia, yes. the Polyphemus, those are all silk moths. And why are they called silk moths? Um, because they're I guess they're they're able to spin up some silk. Um mm -hmm. and they they produce a large pupil case, which is has all kinds of silk woven around it. In fact, the gypsy moth was originally brought into Massachusetts because somebody wanted to cross it with a native silk moth. Right. right. <laughs> well, the luna moth must make a huge pupa, or a, what do we call it? Um, yeah, pupa. Because they're big. I ha can't say I've ever seen the pupil case uh, pupil on that one. I did have a cecropia pupa in my office that somebody brought me one time, and then. I kind of forgot about it, and it it uh, the the moth itself pupated. <laughs> um, I should say the larva. Sorry, the larva puted, pupated, and that the moth emerged in in the spring, and that was the moth I took the picture of. <laughs> oh wow! Very interesting. Ron, do you have uh, do you have bees? Do you keep bees? No, I don't. I don't have bees, Diane. Do you uh, know research about bees or anything like that? I don't know a lot about bees. I'm so, sorry to say, <laughs> too okay. many other things to be concerned about. <laughs> um, what about bumblebees? Are there like I know you said there were fewer of them, right? Yeah, there's still lots of species of bumblebees. 
but there's there they're saying that there are there are a lot more than there are now. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. Oh, it's no. not. Because they're capable of stinging you, but they're also important pollinators. I know. But so fewer species now, you're saying? Fewer yeah. species now than there used to be. Oh, yeah. I thought you said more. Sorry. Sorry. How many are there? I mean. I don't know. Roughly. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a member of Friends of Green River Reservoir, and we're going to have a bee, a bee presentation in November. So we'll learn more about that. Great. Well, we get little bees um, around when our plum trees blossom. We yep. get little tiny bees. I mean, they, there are so many usually. But yep. the, last, the last time, uh, I think it was last year, we didn't see very many. Do they come some years and then not other years? I just don't think it was such a great year last this past year. I had the same experience because I've got a plum tree. So there are lots of little mining bees that are pollinators and they'll be all over that plum tree normally. Yeah. If, so if we have really good weather just after the blossoms come out, lots of sunny weather, warm weather, then you see more of those little pollinators. I don't think we got that weather last year. I didn't have any plums. Yeah, we got some, but not, not as many as we usually do, for sure. Yeah. Well, this was really great. I really enjoyed your pictures. Yeah, what do you take uh, the pictures with anyways? What kind of camera? <laughs> Well, my original ones, of course, were all taken on film with a with a Pentax, <laughs> the original Spotmatic. Um, now I'm in the digital. I have I have Pentax as well as a new Olympus that I got that does focus stacking. That's how I took that one uh, tiger beetle picture that gives you great depth of field, um, and it has a lot, a lot of other amazing features that are great for wildlife. So I've got a super powerful telephoto for it now that I take a lot of my wildlife pictures with, as well as those insect pictures of the dragonflies I take with that telephoto also, because it, it focuses pretty close. And for example, I took the, the uh, humming, humming, hummingbird moth picture with, with a telephoto, that telephoto. Yeah, we've seen a few of those hummingbird moths. Uh, in maybe the past three or four years. I think we've gotten some every year for the past three or four years. Yeah, weren't we thinking it was actually a, a, a hummingbird? Yeah. Like, a, is this a really tiny hummingbird? <laughs> Do they get this small? Yeah, they just flit so fast from one flower to another. In the past, I, I just start to focus on it and would go to another flower. <laughs> they're hard to get. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah. No. It, it was uh, disappointing when we found out it was a lowly insect instead of a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose you think uh, insects are lowly. <laughs> no. <laughs> They'll outlast us, unfortunately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? That was really wonderful. I'm so impressed you with did. those pictures. Do you just take pictures or do you put pins in insects? You know, I didn't put a collection under glass and that kind of stuff or not? No, nope. just Never. take pictures. Yeah. Um, a few of the forest pest adults many, many years ago, if I didn't have a picture of an adult, I would take a picture of a pinned one. Yeah. And then remove the pin in Photoshop in the, in the computer. But uh, I didn't have to do that for very many insects. <laughs> so 
Thank you so much. This was, the pictures are great and so is the information. I, I really appreciate you and your and the time you put into this. This was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thanks, thank Ron. you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dorgan, for putting it together. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>